Welcome back everyone. Welcome to week three. Uh, Super Collider makes a lot of fun sounds and we've spent the last two weeks doing pretty much anything but that. So I want to jump right in and hit the ground running. Uh, at the beginning of week one I said Super Collider appears like one program but actually is several different programs. So we have the IDE, the language, and the server. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner of the screen uh, you can see that there's a little box that says interpreter and it is active and then another box that says server and you can see from the color and the numbers that it's inactive. So when you launch Super Collider the language or the interpreter um, is active right away so you can start coding and getting results from your code but if you want to make any sound uh, we have to manually boot the audio server and the easiest way to do that is to type s.boot and then run that line. And so this uh, sends a message from the language to the server that says wake up and the server wakes up and posts a bunch of information. You should see the numbers in the corner turn green uh, to show that the server is idling and ready for action. Uh, it, I believe that uh, on all platforms Super Collider will latch onto whatever your default audio hardware devices are, whether that's your built-in sound card or some external interface, whatever you have selected in your operating system preferences, that's generally what Super Collider will choose. Uh, if you want to switch devices, you have to actually quit the server, make that change, and, and reboot the server. Uh, and so we can, we can quit the server with s.quit. Uh, we can also, if, we, if we're booted uh, with s.boot, we can run s.reboot, and this will quit and, re quit and boot the server in one go. So one thing we might do is sort of like mess around, change the sample rate, change the audio device, whatever, and then quickly run s.reboot to make those changes kick in. Most audio software, not just Super Collider, uh, doesn't like its hardware, audio hardware being customized while it's alive and active. You know, so it's, it's consistent with a lot of other softwares. Uh, a good question is, how, why does this work? Why, why does s.boot actually, we didn't store anything in s. Um, when we launch Super Collider, all of the single character variables by default have no value in them. s is the one exception, and as a convenience to the user, Super Collider uh, stores a reference to the server application in the interpreter variable s. So if you run just s by itself, you see that it says localhost. Um, so and you've, you've seen me uh, from time to time use like x and y and a and b and whatever just as like a quick convenience to store something and, and work with it. Uh, as a habit, I don't use s for that. If you do accidentally say, you know, something like this, then you know, there's, there's nothing in place to stop you from overwriting the reference to the server application. And so at this point, s.quit will not work because we're saying two dot quit at this point. So if you ever if you ever see something like this and you're like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, Super Collider's broken. Yeah, I broke Super Collider. This is one of the simplest things that can happen. So all you have to do is just, well, I think you can actually just recompile the class library. And I think that's equivalent to just kind of, not exactly equivalent, but similar. So that, that will work just fine. The other thing you can do is s equals uh, capital S server dot local. And that also makes the reassignment uh, active again. Uh, we saw, um, uh, I think last week, uh, we talked about functions. Functions are great at modularizing a small chunk of code and giving it a name in a variable so that we can reuse it very easily and call it with customizable arguments. Uh, you know, just, just as a very simple example, we you know, something like this. Uh, let's see, here's a very, Boring example, we have a function called x, which when evaluated for a particular number returns the value of that number plus 8. Right? So we do this with just a period and parentheses or dot value, same thing. The process for making sound, or uh, to be more specific, the sort of quick and dirty way of making sound is really very similar. We make a function and instead of calling value on it, we call play. And inside that function, instead of a bunch of sort of ordinary math methods and things like that, we fill that function with one or more uh, of a, uh, classes of a, of a member of what's called the unit generator class, or just ugen for short. So there's a help file for ugen, which we can look up. And there are a variety of reference files, uh, like um, browse ugens, tour of ugens, unit generators, and synths. Um, you know, tour of ugens is, is not bad. This is a pretty long help file, which just gives you lots of examples and things like that. Uh, I, uh, on the course website, there is a file called Essential UGENs. 
it's a, there's really not much to that file. It's just sort of listing what I think are like, you know, maybe 20 of the most commonly used unit generators. Uh, and there's also a table in uh, chapter two, which is almost exactly the same information. So uh, just like I said last time, you don't have to memorize the dictionary. We just sort of need to get a handle on a dozen or so UGENs uh, in order to form quote unquote sentences, right? So that we can start speaking to the server and making basic sounds. So let's go ahead and build one of those. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, we, we say uh, dot play on the end of a function. And we're going to fill this. We'll give this a name, I suppose. Uh, x equals this function, which we're going to play. And uh, I'll introduce uh, a very basic unit generator, which is pink noise. This is like the first thing I do every time I enter a studio. I just play pink noise just to calibrate the system, get the right levels. Um, so this, you can see at the top, it's a, it's a UGen, it's a generator. There's a bunch of you know, categories in which these uh, UGens belong. It gives you some similar sort of related UGens. Uh, and just to give you a basic sense of what a UGen is, think of it as like a signal generating or signal processing building block, like a single Lego or something. And you can combine and add and multiply and mix and do all sorts of interesting things with, with many different unit generators to get interesting results. Uh, they're a lot like modules on an analog voltage controlled synthesizer where you can sort of have you know, many different types of modules and interconnect them in interesting ways. So they're just, you know, just uh, oscillators, noise generators, filters, sound file, playback, UGENs, uh, you know, things that generate triggers to control envelopes. Envelopes are also a type of UGEN, et cetera, et cetera. Lots and lots of UGENs. So we're, we're just going to say uh, pink noise.ar. And this, this alone is sufficient to make sound. And before you do, um, there's a couple things. Don't try to run this yet because you're going to, if you don't know how to stop it, uh, you know, you're going to be in, in for a, a surprise. So the, the keyboard shortcut to stop, to basically, which just wipes everything off the server, your sort of emergency panic button, is uh, command period. This is, uh, you know, Mac OS. It's control on Windows and Linux. So uh, also, um, by default, the output of UGENs is nominal, which means it's in the case of the digital signal, it's going to be full amplitude. So, for example, if your uh, system, I can't access my system volume right now, but I did calibrate this ahead of time. Um, if your system volume is all the way up and you just play a, a signal producing unit generator without specifying any, anything otherwise, you can expect that to be pretty loud and startling. Um, so I'll, I'll play this. I, I know this is not going to be crazy loud, but just to get a sense of, of how loud it is right now. Right, so I just, I just did a command enter to run this clump and then command period to just wipe it away. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I, let's, the first thing let's do, let's just talk about how to make this quieter. Right, there's a couple different options. Probably the most straightforward is to use multiplication. Um, if we multiply something by one, it doesn't change. If we multiply something by zero, it's completely silent. Uh, we're going to hit command period to destroy that silent process anyway. So something like 0.2, 0.1. Uh, if you want to deal with uh, in decibels, you can do that. You just provide the reduction or increase in decibels that you want. Let's go down 10 decibels. And we can't just run this because SuperCollider does not know that we want to think of this number as a value in decibels. It's going to treat it like normal multiplication. And what it will do is invert the signal and scale it up by a factor of 10. It's not what we want. So we say dB amp. And if we just run this expression, we can see that it converts to the appropriate multiplicative scalar to, that corresponds to this reduction in decibels. So 10, 20, 30, et cetera. Really, I mean, I think decibels are nice because if you try to work with raw numbers, then you're just sort of kind of guessing. I mean, you, you can keep in mind that reducing an amplitude scalar by a factor of uh, half, like doubling or, or reducing in half, corresponds to six decibels in either direction. But then if you want to go down by 37 decibels, like how do you do that? You know, you, no one's going to want to do that math. So this is a convenient option. Uh, so other other generators just to give you kind of the sense of default settings will go down 20 decibels here's your basic sine wave here's your basic pulse wave sawtooth 
Uh, there's a triangle wave, which is uh, LF tri, capital L, capital F, capital T. Um, here's an impulse generator. This has a lot of uses when it's run at low frequencies. Um, here's, uh, so we, we saw pink noise, right? Heard pink noise. So here's white noise, brown noise, uh, clip noise. This one, if I recall correctly, is kind of dirty sounding. Yeah, I think this is just all the sample values are negative one, zero, or positive, or maybe just negative one and positive one. It's like noise which has been, you know, clipped to the point where. Anyway, huge variety of things. Uh, if you, you know, if you go to, um, let's go back uh, to browse UGENs. This sort of takes us to the help browser where we can look through the various categories of UGENs. For example, here's filters, generators, uh, random, triggers. These are various categories that I think contain a bunch of interesting things. You know, lots of fun. Uh, let's, let's go to, um, back to pink noise here. And um, uh, let's talk about this dot AR, what this means. We're probably a little bit accustomed at this point to the idea of saying, you know, the name of a class dot new as a way of creating a, a tangible, usable instance of that class. We don't really do that with UGENs. Uh, it's a similar concept in that dot AR creates a tangible instance of pink noise for us to work with. Uh, the AR stands for audio rate. Uh, and the other, the other rates are KR for control rate and IR for initialization rate. And here's a very quick summary. I, the book goes into a lot more detail on, on sort of what these mean. But uh, AR produces a signal that generates uh, samples at, ge generates or processes samples at the sample rate. So it's the highest resolution signal possible. If you want to hear, in other words, play the signal to speakers, uh, it needs to run at the audio rate. That's the only way to get signal to speakers. Uh, KR produces samples at a fraction of the rate that AR UGENs produce. And by default, I believe it is one sample for every 64 audio samples. So you can think of these as like a low resolution version of these signals. So uh, basically, if, if you ever have any signal which is like running at a very low frequency, or like a, an envelope with a really long attack or really long release or so, you know, so anything which is very slow moving and something which we're not going to be monitoring directly, KR is usually the right choice. Uh, it, you know, it's low resolution, but unless the signal is zipping around really, really fast, we just don't need that resolution. And so running at, the, at KR is computationally more efficient. And then IR is arguably the least commonly used, but it, it basically a, a unit generator running at the initialization rate produces exactly one value when it is first created and then holds that value forever. So it can't be changed. And there are a lot of UGENs like sine waves and oscillators and generators which don't even respond to that method because there's no point in, you know, if you want a sine wave, there's no, you, you can't run it at the initialization rate. It's just going to be a constant value. Um, so uh, there's a couple of examples when IR is, is useful. It's obviously the cheapest in terms of CPU, but not as useful as AR and KR. So uh, anyway, th that's, that's rates, basically. Uh, you know, the theoretically, you can run everything at the audio rate. And unless a UGEN is um, you know, designed not to respond to that method, then everything can just run at the audio rate and everything will be fine. You just won't be using your computer's processor very efficiently. OK. So let's talk about um, arguments. We, we've seen arguments in a couple of different contexts. When we define a function, we can provide arguments there. But we've also seen arguments in the context of uh, certain methods, like pow, which is to the power of. This, this method uh, expects an argument. You know, we have to provide the exponent. And UGINs are, are like that as well. So if we sort of get rid of this here, uh, and we, we want to make some pink noise, uh, we, can, we can look in the help file at pink noise and scroll down a little bit, and we get 
class methods. And so we see that uh, pink noise expects two arguments which, have, which are called mull and add and which have default values of 1 and 0. Uh, so if we crack open a set of parentheses here, a little pop-up comes and says, hey, here's what you need to provide. Now, we didn't provide anything, so the default values were used. And the mull value, uh, here's what that means. It, it means a, a number which will be multiplied by every sample in the output signal. And the default is 1, which means it virtually has no effect. Uh, and add is a number that will be added to every sample. And the default is 0, so again, it has no effect. So uh, if we want to listen to pink noise, we don't really want to add anything to it because that produces uh, what's called DC offset or DC bias, uh, and that's not really good for speakers. But mull is an argument which can be used as an amplitude scalar. So if we say 0.5 here, and it comes down by a little bit, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, right? or decibels are fine, it's the same idea. Here's. Uh, and um, let's, let's look at another one here. So if we go, uh, uh, here's our triangle wave, low frequency triangle wave. Here's a great example of eugens not all being created equal. Uh, it might be tempting to be like, oh, okay, so I got this cool synthesis algorithm going, but I don't want pink noise here, I want a triangle wave. And to just swap one for the other, um, you should never assume that two eugens have the exact same arguments in the exact same order. And this is a great example because LF tri is an oscillator, and its arguments are as follows. Uh, frequency, initial phase, and then mull and add. Mull and add are kind of eugens for, for, you'll find those in every single eugen. They're just there. They're always like the last two, almost always the last two. Uh, so pink noise is not an oscillator, so it doesn't have a frequency, but triangle wave is. So this, this would be a, a pretty silly thing to do. Uh, in fact, I bet this would blow up because uh, the... No, actually, it wouldn't blow up. It would just be a really, really, really low frequency. Um, I know, like, LF tri does not like negative frequency values. Um, but this, this value evaluates to 0.1, which means we're going to produce a triangle wave at 0.1 hertz, and we just won't hear anything. Um, there's something going on, right? There's the, this, if you push Command M, you'll open the meters, and the triangle wave is running, and the speaker probably doesn't like it too much. Uh, a good, a good um, technique for new users is to rely on keywords when you're coding. So when you uh, open up a, a, you know, a set of parentheses when you're dealing with any method, not just UGen methods like AR and KR, you can immediately press tab as soon as you see the pop-up text, and it will enter this keyword for you. And you can say, oh, good, frequency. Let's do uh, 200 hertz. And then a comma, and um, and then a space, and then another tab, and there you go. You get your phase, initial phase, uh, which we'll d keep at zero. And then for the mull, we'll say let's bring this down 15 decibels. And now we can play this. Okay. So the, yeah, just to reiterate, um, if you're just you know you have a. a something, or whatever, sinos.ar, you open parentheses and then press tab. And then if you keep pressing tab, it'll cycle through the arguments. Yeah, so this is all built into the IDE. Um, there are, there's a couple of rules when it comes to keywords. Um, for example, you can do uh, something like this where you say, okay, the first thing is going to be 200, and then I want to skip directly to mull. Um, so what SuperCollider does here is it says, okay, the, I don't have a keyword here, so I'm assuming it's going to be the first argument, so it uses this for frequency. And then it receives a keyword and says, oh, okay, so then this next value is going to be for mull. That's all it gets. So it's going to use the default for phase and add. You know, I don't necessarily recommend this method because it kind of mixes and matches. You're, you're labeling one but not the other. It works just fine. Um, but what you can't do is uh, something like this, and then just to say like zero for the phase. Once you start providing keywords, uh, SuperCollider needs keywords from that. I think this will just produce an error. Right? Yeah. yeah, it just doesn't like it. 
it, it, it actually sees it as a syntax error, which is a little bit surprising, maybe. Um, so uh, the, I, the first companion code in chapter two, companion code 2.1, this one goes through some of the sort of gotchas with using keywords. Uh, generally speaking, I think you know it's it's fine to be verbose when you're starting out. You might even want to put these on separate lines, like this. You know, just so it's very clear what each value is for a uh, triangle wave. And while we're here um, talking about triangle waves and arguments and things like that, I might as well introduce one of a few different, or maybe a couple of few different visual tools that help you work with UGENs. Because if we didn't have visual tools, it's just us and the code and the help files, and that can be very disorienting because you just, you know, it's not, I like being able to see my waveforms from a bunch of different perspectives as I work. We've already seen the meters. This is command M. You can also type s.meter to bring those up, and I think it's also in the server dropdown menu. And in that drop-down menu, there's other things. Um, uh, the, free, the scope, the freak scope. The, the scope is a, is an oscilloscope. This will, uh, oops, uh, this doesn't work, does it? Yeah, so this one, yeah. So this gives us a little scope to work with. Um, you can adjust the, this probably has a technical name in like engineering circles when you're dealing with analog scopes. But whatever this, this is like a horizontal zoom or something, and then you have a vertical zoom. Looks like the amplitude changes, but it, we're just scaling the visual thing. So um, there's also the freak scope, uh, which is a, a, a real-time spectrum analyzer. So we get to look at the spectrum of that waveform. We have the fundamental and then various overtones. And uh, one really useful class is called plotter. Now we don't really do like plotter.new or anything like that, but you can. But what you can do is replace play with plot and then um, run this and it will plot a, a chunk of that signal. And uh, so uh, by, by default, uh, what, let's see if we're doing this for function. Yeah, here are the arguments for plot when you're plotting a UGen function, the duration, which is really only the one we care about. Um, other, like, other things are scaling and moving the plot around and things like that. But the duration by default is a hundredth of a second. And that's, that's pretty good for like a lot of audible frequencies because if we were to plot like a whole second of a 200 hertz triangle wave, we'd get 200 cycles crammed into that one window. Um, so if we set that to one, then uh, takes a whole second to generate that. And then it's just kind of aliased, right? So it's not really useful. It's just kind of all squashed in there. So uh, yeah, so just, just plotting a few hundredths of a second is often very good. So this, this gives us a sense of what the waveform looks like. You can see that because we've applied a minus 15 decibel value to the mull, it's scaled down. So it only peaks just below 0.2 and up instead of all of the, instead of up at its default value of, of one. Uh, and what I especially like about plot is that it helps us um, understand how phase works and how phase manifests. Um, so if we go to LF try, and it's, it's good to read about this because different UGENs have a phase input, but they don't always have the same range. Some are zero to one. This one for some reason is zero to four. Sine, sine OSC is from zero to two pi. Uh, so. For example, the, the default value of zero, uh, it means we start at a point in the waveform where we're right at the middle and it's going up. So if we set the phase to be two, this should be halfway through that cycle because the range is zero to four. So in this case, we actually start at a point in that cycle where we're halfway but going down, halfway. And if we set this to one, then uh, we start one quarter of the way through the cycle. So like if this is our zero reference point, then here's one, which is where we start. Here's two, here's three. So this is especially useful if you're using unit generators to control other unit generators. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, so what we'll do here, just gonna introduce the very basics of modulation. And to do that, we're gonna code a little bit more cleanly and declare some variables. 
uh, we'll say our modulator and our signal. So mod is going to be LF try running at the control rate because it's going to be, you know, modulating some other signal. And we'll have this just go one cycle per second. Nice slow triangle wave. And the signal, I'm, I'm skipping over something, but we'll come back to it. We'll use a sine wave running at the audio rate because this is what we want to play. And uh, what we can do is, is give this a, a default, uh, give this a frequency of 200. And we're going to add to that mod. And then we'll say, uh, scale it down by 12 decibels. And don't plot it. Let's play it. If I play this, I, it'll, we'll hear sound, but it's probably going to sound like um, it's fixed at 200 hertz. Maybe if you listen very carefully, you can hear just the slightest bit of wobble in the frequency. But um, does anyone know why we're not hearing a nice large frequency modulation? Very close. Yeah, you, you said we're, we're modulating by one hertz, which is correct, but uh, the it's not too slow. The the question is, what is the actual, what are the output values of this unit generator? Let's let's plot it, right? Um, we'll just we'll just take this and say, just plot me a. In fact, this is <laughs> this is so slow that we'd have to plot like um, you know like four seconds or something to get a full cycle. Or not four seconds, uh, you know. So this, here we go, and yeah, we just plotted four seconds of this one hertz triangle oscillator. Starts here, goes up to one, goes down to negative one, goes up to one, right? So these, these values here, they don't just represent something, they are, they're literal, literally these are the values that are coming out of this triangle wave. It starts at zero, it goes to a positive value of plus one, down to a negative value, and then it repeats that cycle once a second. So the values we're adding to 200, uh, at their maximum, they're one, and at their minimum, they're negative one. So the frequency of the sine wave is fluctuating between 201 hertz and 199 hertz. That's a really small amount, perceptually. So how can we fix that? Yes, how do we make it bigger? We multiply it, right? Yeah, and just um, uh, let, me, let me give you a, yeah, okay, so let's, let's, just, let's just do that. It doesn't really make sense to convert to decibels here because we're not thinking in terms of like, you know, sound perception level. We just want these numbers to be bigger, right? So what's a good number to multiply this by? Okay, what's, what's an octave above 200 hertz? Right, okay, so how would we, what, what number would we put here? 200, 200. right. Uh, so because now this is going to fluctuate from 200, sorry, uh, from, yeah, positive to negative 200. So this mod here is fluctuating between negative and positive 200, and so the frequency of sine OSC will be 400 at the modulator's peak and zero at the, uh, so here we go. And we've been doing command period, but we can also do x dot free. And if you if you play a function and store the result of that play command in a variable, then you can talk to that live sound process through that variable. And free is a message that says poof, you're gone, just hard stop. Uh, and so so now we can you know th this is like a really really simple introduction to modulation. And the, and the, by that I mean you can create ugens and then use them to influence parameters of other eugens. This is the basis of amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, uh, and, and lots of other techniques sort of in that category. Um, let's see, so other, other things we could do. Uh, okay, so you, as we could just change this, let's just change this to a bigger number, right? Here's five, 10. And then if we want to, you know, automate this process, 
instead of having to sit here and manually you know, start and stop at a frequency, start and stop at a frequency. If we wanted this modulator frequency to go up and down, how, how would we do that? Get another one. Get another one. Yeah, let's call it um, mod mod. Not a good naming scheme, I know, but I'm, I'm feeling a little funky today. Uh, how do we want to modulate the modulator's frequency? What, what can we do to it? Should we, should we use another triangle wave, perhaps? Maybe a, a sine wave? No? Let's actually introduce a new generator here. Let's do, um, let's do a noise generator, okay? And we could use pink noise. You know, let's just, in the sake of experimentation, let's just go ahead and, and um, see what that sounds like. Uh, now this, again, this is going to range from 1 to negative 1, and I don't think we want to plug those in for LF try. I just know from experience that if you give LF try a negative frequency, uh, what it, it responds to that, and it, and it doesn't just flip the polarity, it actually just goes, keeps going negative <laughs> or something. It does some really strange thing. Uh, um, probably a good explanation for that. So, so what I want to do is I want to set the range of this pink noise to be something sensible. So when I say something sensible, I mean, you know, we know what one sounds like, woo, woo. We know what 10 sounds like, woo, 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 right? Fast, but not crazy fast. So maybe we want to range this pink noise from one to 10. Okay, sure. Uh, now we, how do we do that, right? We can't just multiply it by a number because the default range is negative to positive one. So all that will do is scale it in both directions. So we would need to like scale and shift. And we could do that with mull and add. Like, you know, we'd, we'd have to like scale it by four and a half and then add five and a half or something like that. Some really annoying math. I mean, like, you know, if we, I'll draw you a picture. This is like the- Does it multiply first or? It multiplies first. Good question. Yeah, when you have a mull and an add, mull is applied first, then add. Okay. Yeah, so multiply like- five, add five. Yeah, something like that. So like if our pink noise is, uh, you know, positive one, negative one. If we do uh, mull 4.5, then the first thing that happens is it, it scales, you know, up like this. This is a terrible drawing, but it goes up to 4.5, negative 4.5. And then, like, so this is mull uh, 4.5. And then add, I might be doing the math wrong. It would be zero to ten. Yes. That, okay. So that's we don't have to deal with decimals, and that's a little bit nicer. But I, I, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is like the last way I suggest doing this. This is why mull and add exist. But there are several methods which you, know, so you can see that. Okay. Just to finish the thought here, add would then take this scaled waveform and shift it up so that it's between one and ten. Yeah. But we don't we don't want to do that because that's we don't like mental gymnastics. So. Uh, what we can do is, you know, we, we have the, we just leave the mull and add values at their defaults, like one and zero, mull one, add zero. And then we can just say dot range. So dot range is a method that on the back end assumes we have the default mull and add and then figures out the mull and add values that we need in order to get to this range. So we just get to specify the min and the max, and off it goes. Right? Let's see what this sounds like. It might be a little like, like garbly, I think. I don't exactly know, but here, here we go. That's interesting. It is moving a little bit, right? It's the whoa, 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 are not constant anymore. But I think this pink noise is just moving so fast that it's, you know, it, it tends to average out or something like that. It's like, so. Here's, here's um, a better choice, which is to use uh, a low frequency noise generator. Uh, and there are three which I'll introduce right here, zero, one, and two. Uh, zero is non-interpolating noise. One is linearly interpolating noise. Two is quadratic interpolated noise. Easiest is to just show you a picture of these, what we'll do is, um, uh, eh, let's see, what if we just plot this? Perfect, yeah. So that's what this noise signal looks like. We'll make it a little bit 
faster. Right? Uh, LF noise one, random numbers but connected with linear segments. LF noise two, connected with quadratic segments. Um, so if we do LF noise zero, let's let's make it pick. Um, uh, I don't know, five values per second. Again, we should put a keyword here. Even though this is a noise generator, it does have a frequency parameter, which is the rate at which it generates random values. Uh, so let's see what this sounds like. So it's sort of instantaneously changing from one modulator speed to the next. And if we make this one, it's gonna smoothly change from one modulator speed to the next. It's a subtle difference. It's a lot easier to hear what these uh, noise generators sound like if we stop doing so much crazy stuff. <laughs> and uh, you know, for for example, you know, you don't, I know I know I'm going really fast with the typing, but um, just uh, you can just sort of watch for a second. So if we just have uh, this modulator, which is let's say 200 to 2,000, and and we'll just plug that in here as a raw frequency value. The number you have dialed is you know, the um, so that you can make this faster, and we've arrived at you know classic 1950s computer music, uh, and so that's so we'll slow this down again, maybe even more. So this is LF noise zero, where there is no interpolation between successive random values. LF noise one is using linear interpolation. And two, which I don't think sounds, is gonna to sound too perceptually different. will interpolate with curves instead of lines. Um, so these are, all, these are all fun things to try. The, the last two or three problems on the second homework assignment involve um, you know, creating simple real world sounds, uh, you know, like police sirens and sprinklers and things like that using these modulation techniques. So uh, let me show you another one real quick. Um, so let's, let's take our LF pulse. Um, Eugen. So LF pulse is, is a, again, we can just very quickly plot that. Like if we plot a faster version. Uh, now we need an even, I have so many plots open. Okay. Uh, oh yes, let's do uh, AR and we'll plot too much. It's a lot of guesswork here. Yeah, so this is just um, a pulse wave. It switches on, it switches off, switches on, switches off. And LF pulse has a default range of one to zero instead of one to negative one. Again, no, no two Eugens are created equal. Um, some of them have a bipolar output range by default. Others are unipolar. They all have different arguments. So again, just don't, don't make any assumptions. Look at the help file, plot before you play, um, et cetera. So you know, this is, um, uh, a couple of fun things we can do with this. Uh, let's say, uh, we'll just, you know, a very basic thing we can do is uh, use it as an amplitude modulator. So we have our pulse wave with no mull and add business. These are just frequency values. Uh, so it's gonna range from zero to one, eight times a second, and we're using it to scale the amplitude. So it turns on and off. Right? Uh, and uh, we can also like set its range. Let's delete this first. Um, set its range to be you know, your two favorite frequencies. Uh, and then do this. So the same, same pulse wave, different range being used to modulate a different parameter. And you could, you know, an exercise would be to combine these two and sort of use, use two pulse waves to modulate amplitude and uh, frequency at the same time. You may have noticed that uh, throughout this lecture so far, everything is monophonic. If you're on headphones or, or if you've noticed that sounds only coming out of 
and uh, let's let's fix that. The reason that happens is because by default, with, with a few uh, notable exceptions like panners and some reverbs, UGENs are one signal, one channel, monophonic. And uh, often we want to work with stereo sound, two channels of audio. Sometimes it's the same signal in both channels, other times they're a little bit different to give us a sense of stereo imagery. Here's the, the one sentence summary. Supercollider interprets an array of signals as a multi-channel signal. So if you provide an array of two signals and try to play that, it will automatically assign the, the lowest indexed signal to the lowest numbered hardware output, and then it will just consecutively go down the line. So, you know, for example, if you have eight speakers and an audio interface with eight outputs, you can play an eight channel signal by giving an array of eight signals, and they will automatically get assigned to all eight. So this is really lots of fun. So here's an example of, you know, here's like the long version of what that looks like. If we want to play, if we want to do like a binaural beating thing, like play 300 hertz over here and 304 hertz over here, uh, the, the long way of doing that is to say uh, something like this. We just uh, create a, an array of two sine waves. So you know, we declare a variable, we set it equal to an array of two sine waves at different frequencies, and then we overwrite that assignment with the, uh, the value we've just established times this amplitude scalar. And you might remember when we have an array of things, not just numbers or signals, just an array of values, and we multiply it by something, that operation is applied to everything. So what this what this does, it looks like we're just taking this amplitude scalar and multiplying it by one thing, and in a sense we are, but remember that that one thing is an array of multiple things. And so this sine OSC gets scaled by 20 decibels, and this sine OSC gets scaled by 20 decibels. Yeah, and you can slow it down a little bit. So this has sort of a different effect depending on whether you're listening on speakers or on headphones, but uh, we can even we can see it on the scope if we zoom in and, and set the set the zooms appropriately. Yeah, so they're not quite the same frequency, and so we get a fun fun effect here. Uh, so it's it's at this point that I want to introduce the concept of something called multi-channel expansion. There is a help file, or rather a guide file, called multi-channel expansion. This is a syntactical feature of super, well, I, I guess it's a syntactical feature, but it's also a design of the, of, uh, you know, how, uh, how arrays propagate through a, a function of UGENs. Uh, and here's the single sentence summary of multi-channel expansion. If you provide a single UGEN with an array of values for one of its arguments, it will automatically expand to an array of UGENs and distribute those values to the various UGENs. So we could rewrite this as, forget about these brackets, we don't need them. We don't need them there anyway. And forget about this second sine wave. We just say 300, 301 for the frequency of this sine wave. So this, this is just a, a simpler uh, way of expressing the previous example. Same result. Right, so you see on the meters, we have two signals. We again have our, our two waveforms on the scope. Now what do you suppose would happen if we did uh, something like this? Well, first of all, let's confirm that this, this method actually works for array. I think it does. Right. So this dB amp is applied to both of these numbers, so both of these numbers are treated as decibel values. So sig here is an array of two sine OSCs, one at 300, one at 301, and then we multiply it by an array of two decibel values. Well, we can just sort of see what happens over here, right? Just see what that behavior actually looks like. And the behavior is to take corresponding pairs. 
and apply the operation, which is often exactly what we want in a signal processing context. You know, we have like eight sine waves and we want to apply eight amplitudes. You just do matrix multiplication. Now, you probably remember from some math classes that matrix multiplication can mean different things, cross product, dot product, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, you can do those operations in Super Collider, but I rarely found the need to do so, and usually this, this is what I want. And um, as just, let, what if we do this? What's it going to do here? Right, now this is another good question. We have two arrays of different sizes, and we're applying... Is that going to be Wrapped, yes. We, the, what's going to happen is Super Collider says, great, two times four, three times five, and then it's like, mm, I got one more here. So it's going to go back to two and it's going to give us an array of size 3. So this is also kind of nice because if you have like 100 signals and you multiply by like four random amplitude values, they'll just get imprinted onto each cluster of four oscillators and, and that's, that's pretty nice. So, so what will happen here is that the, the 301 hertz will be a little bit louder. And we can confirm that on the scope. Right, the right channel is, has greater amplitude than the other one. So let's, in, the, in our last five minutes or so, let's get to something fun and interesting. Uh, and I think for, for next week, we'll talk about arguments in the context of these functions and what they actually mean and what they do. And also um, we'll talk about envelopes, which we haven't gotten to yet either. We're, right now we're just turning sound on and turning sound off and there's no fade in, there's no way to sustain them, you know, for a specific amount of time. Um, but let's, if you remember, we can generate random values, right? Let's from 100 to, uh, I don't know, say 8,000, right? Like this. And if we enclose a random expression in parentheses and use the duplication shortcut, the exclamation point, we create an array of uniquely chosen random. You can probably see where I'm going with this, right? Why don't we do 50? Right? And, and since we're going to use these for frequency, we'll do x brand so that they produce a, what, will, what will be uh, interpreted as a more uniform sort of perception of pitch. Uh, so we'll just copy this expression. Uh, well, actually, we'll just copy this first. And we're going to say uh, frequency is going to be this thing here. And we'll say this right now this don't get too excited because we're not we're not quite there yet uh, if we play this well, let's even make it 20 again let's run it again well, it's different every time but what's happening is uh let's, let's turn, dial this back a little bit it's different every time but we only hear two frequencies right that is because uh right now the super collider server is configured so that it only sees two hardware signal destinations. Um, because when we open the meters, we only have two output channels. You know, in this room we have more speakers, but I'm just going out of the HDMI port on my computer, which I can only carry two signals. So even if we were to expand the meters and things like that, we, we only have eight speakers, and even if I could somehow get to them, we can't play 50 oscillators each in its own speaker, we just don't have the speakers. Maybe someday you'll find yourself in an environment where you do have like 100 or 200 speakers at your disposal, in which case you will have a lot of fun with Super Collider. But for now, what we want to do is do a mix down of these 50. I mean, if we, if we um, let's see, what else can we do here just to, I mean, if we, if we do uh, sig.postln, or let's do sig.size, and then we'll just put a zero at the end. One thing I forgot to mention is that Super Collider will when you're doing this function dot play business, it always tries to route the last expression to your speakers. So putting a zero at the end is a is a quick quick and dirty trick to just like make sure that it doesn't play anything. And uh, oh, I gotta say dot post ln here. Right? So sure enough, this is a an array of size 50. We could even just post the whole thing, and we see it's a, it's an array of all these you know internal things. But uh, to actually hear all 50, we have to mix down. And um, just to be safe, I'm going to dial this back even more because we are going to be summing. Yeah, so uh, what we'll do is, is just here, sig.sum. And just to show you what that does, 
if we take this array here and just say dot sum, it adds the numbers together. And that's what we want to do with these, with these signals. We have 50 sine waves. We want to add them together. And what that essentially means is it's taking the 50 samples, the, you know, the, the first sample in each of the 50 sine waves, adding those together. And then the next sample for each of the 50 sine waves, adding those together. So it's kind of just going sample by sample, adding them together. This is mixing 101. This is what we say when, we, when we're mixing. We're just adding signals together. So this will produce a monophonic mix of 50 nominal amplitude sine waves, which if, if we didn't do any scaling, it would definitely clip and be really distorted. In fact, let's go down to 40 just to be a little, a little safer. And then we'll just do take that mono signal and copy it to an array of two. So we'll hear it in, in both channels. Yeah, and if we run it again, it's different. Here's one, one fun trick. You can, if you do function.play with, with just sort of like ba basic stuff, no fancy stuff, um, uh, you know, I should be more specific, but like, you know, the, when we get down the road, we'll see that we actually put envelopes into our functions ourselves, in which case this, this might not necessarily work, but if you're just doing basic UGen stuff, you can fade it out over a, a duration. We don't yet have the ability to fade it in, but we will get there. Uh, and the last thing I want to do, because this, this mono mix is like not the most exciting thing in the world because it produces an image which is kind of right in the middle, I want to introduce one more unit generator, which is uh, splay. Uh, so let's. So what we'll, we'll do here is sig equals splay. Dot ar sig. What sig? What sig? What splay does is it just takes as its first argument an array of arbitrary size containing a bunch of signals, right? So 50 signals, 100 signals, even just two signals. And it will output a stereo signal, a, a two-channel signal, uh, that is a mix of all of the input signals, and it distributes them spatially across the stereophonic field. So the, the, the zeroth item is panned hard left, and the last item is panned hard right, and it sort of linearly does a panning algorithm for each of the ones in between. Uh, and this is often a really nice, I, I also think splay does level compensation, so I, I don't think we need nearly as much uh, going down. And we don't want to do this duplication thing anymore because uh, splay outputs a two-channel signal. So you can see it's much quieter because splay is doing some internal, it, it tries to compensate based on the size of the array it receives. So if we do you know, something like this. And so this produces, as, as you can sort of see, a stereo signal. So, you know, if we compare that to um, the previous version, you know, this. Uh, the, these are the exact same signal in both channels. Yeah. Uh, so, display can be really nice, uh, you know, and you can, you can kind of, kind of the sky's the limit here. I mean, what if we do 200? It almost starts to, you know, sound kind of noisy because there's so many things going on. Change the, change the range here. Yeah. Other fun things you can do is um, round each item to the nearest multiple. So this will be a harmonic series, kind of a rant of on 30 hertz. Yeah, do you want to be careful? Like, you wouldn't necessarily want to round to 300 when the minimum is so low because a lot of numbers get rounded down to zero. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of little gotchas that you have to watch out for. But, um, you know, this is just kind of to whet your appetite on, uh, on just working with UGENs. And there's, there's more to discuss. We'll talk about arguments and give ourselves the ability to change a sound while it's playing. We'll talk about envelopes. Uh, so we have sort of timing control over parameters, amplitude, and others. And next week, we'll also introduce uh, the concept of synth and synth def, because you might notice in the post window, we're seeing all these things that say, OK, here's a synth, here's a synth. So this function.play is really just a, a shortcut for the more 
uh, formal and flexible way of defining a sound and then executing that sound. So this, this is like basically a convenient shortcut where we don't we, have, we can get, we get to skip some steps, um, but we'll we'll talk about the formal process um, next week. So I, I encourage you to take a look at homework two, um, even though maybe not all of it will be doable at this point, but some of them should be, and just just to get a sense of what's going to be expected of you and get the two weeks from now, right? Yeah, just like homework one. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and um, we'll see you next week.